Today, we're going to dive into Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, as we talk about the wrestling match between our spirit and our flesh. Our flesh is the desires that we have disconnected from God, the motivations we have disconnected from the power of God, the purpose that we try to pursue in and of ourselves, and the spirit of the living God who wants to conform our desires into his image, who wants to change our motivations and give us purpose like we've never seen before. Do we live by the flesh or do we live by the spirit? Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and death. Peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Last night I was putting my girls to bed, and uh, they have this diversionary tactic after the lights go off where they ask me questions, they get me talking because that allows them to stay up for a little while longer. So in an effort to refute their uh, fetal pleas, I just set a 10-minute timer, and I just let it roll, and then at 10 minutes, we cut off the show. So my daughter, Lexi, who's here, she said, hey, what are you preaching on tomorrow? I was like, the spirit versus the flesh. And uh, I asked them a question. I'll ask you, uh, how many of you think it's better to follow God's ways than your ways by a show of hands? And I said, and they said that we rather follow God's ways than our ways. And um, I said, well, what happens if you follow your own flesh? And my daughter, Audrey, she's seven. All of a sudden she goes, well, Jonah tried to do it his own way, daddy. And when Jonah tried to do it his own way, he started running from God. And she just went off in this whole scripture. I was like, okay, girl, we might need to give you a mic on a Sunday. <laughs> but it's not always as simple as living by the Spirit, doing things God's way, or doing it our way in the flesh, right? Because many times our flesh is deceitful. Many times we think we're doing it God's way and we're operating out of our flesh. What happens when you're so disconnected from the Spirit of God that you think you're doing it the right way and you're actually doing it the wrong way? That's actually the testimony of the author of the book we're reading right now, Paul. Before Paul was Paul, his name was Saul. And when Paul's name was Saul, he thought he knew it all. He thought he knew it all because he had mastered the scroll. He mastered the scrolls but didn't know the Spirit. And because he didn't know the Spirit... He ended up fighting everything that the heart of the scroll was trying to tell him. God gave it to me just like that I was, as I was playing with my son in the pool this week on vacay. He said, just say it like that. The, the desires that we have in and of ourselves are rooted in self-gratification. Self-gratification. And those desires lead to our motives that oftentimes see the goal in the short term and overlook the consequences in the long term when we're operating out of our flesh. When we're operating out of our flesh, we can see God as a limitation versus someone who is for us. When we operate in the Spirit, our desires are fueled vertically. Our motives pursue life and peace. And our view of God is one of, he's a limitless source of every need. A few weeks ago, I was hanging out with one of my mentors. And when you're picking a mentor, 
pick someone that's further ahead in an area that you want to grow, and they got there in a way that you admire. They don't need to be a perfect person in every area. You're trying to find a mentor, not a guru. We can't go to another planet and find a Yoda. There's, it doesn't exist on this side of the earth. And so this guy, he's an amazing leader. Not because of what he says, but over the last two, three years, uh, he's got a really big team, and a lot of people who come to church, they work for him. And, and what they say about this man behind his back is inspirational. And so I'm like, anytime I get a chance, I'm like, I want to just sit and learn from this guy. And his business looks completely different than anything I do day to day, but the spirit by which he does it lines up with my heart. And so a few weeks ago, I was hanging out with him, and we were talking, and he's in his 50s. And when he was 28... He was growing in his walk with Christ. He's an engineer, and he started thinking, dang, if I love Jesus, I probably need to be in ministry. And so he was about to leave being an engineer, but as he prayed about it, sought God's word about it, and mentors, he realized, no, 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 I'm not supposed to leave my career. I'm supposed to live in it as a believer. And so along this process, little by little, he realized that for him, being a leader wasn't about how many plates that he can keep spinning, but how can he raise up other leaders to own a plate and grow in their leadership? And God started teaching him that that was his purpose in life, to be a leader that raises up other leaders. And so fast forward 30 years later, and I'm walking around with him at work. I'm meeting people who walk up and say, hey, when he came to this place, I was overlooked. I was underpaid. People didn't see my gifts, but he saw it. He gave me an opportunity, and now I'm feeding my family like I never have before because of this leader. And here's the amazing part about walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. God doesn't want to neuter you. He doesn't want to sterilize you into his image where you have no personality, where you're not fun anymore, where you don't pursue the best things in life. He actually wants you to surrender your heart to him so he can give you everything that you've been designed to have. And what happens on the other side of it is, is you're actually more you than you've ever been before. He came that you may have life and have it to the full and that you walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be, not that you are shrunk into this weird person that doesn't even exist. God knew your humor. He gave it to you. Now, he wants you to surrender it to him so he can actually make you even more funny. He gave you your drive and your zest for life. He gave that to you. He doesn't want to take that away from you, but he wants to repurpose it for even more purpose. I'm trying to get uh, Katie Walters to preach this sermon, but I was sitting with her one day and she told me some of her testimony. When she first gave her life to Christ, she loved fashion and she thought she had to give up fashion. And so she gave up fashion. And then God, when he saw that she was willing to give up fashion, he gave her a Francis and Benedict. He gave her a ministry that is based around fashion, but has a different level of purpose because she was willing to surrender everything to him. And so God wants to give you 10 times more than you could on your own strength. But the first step looks like surrender. And so reading through Romans chapter 8, I don't want you to see Paul as a theologian talking down to you. I want you to see Paul as a man with a testimony who God has changed everything in his life, and he's trying to give you major keys on how to live this life to the full. And so let's go back and look at Paul's actual testimony. This is found in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You think I would actually just mark these things? That would also be helpful. Maybe next service we'll do it. All right. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. So context is you have to read Acts 7. Acts chapter 8 is another story. And then Acts chapter 9 picks up on Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 the first Christian martyr was killed. His name was Stephen. 
And Saul was there. He approved of this because Saul was a Pharisee. He had mastered the scrolls and he thought his purpose was in life was to extinguish these crazy followers of the way. The way. Before you were called a Christian, you were called a follower of the way. And he thought these people were a scourge to Judaism. And so he gave his life purpose to fighting against these crazy believers. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he was coming for everybody, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And this begins the conversion experience of Saul, who became Paul, who now we're studying the work that he wrote in Romans chapter 8. Saul thought he knew it all, but he was actually warring with God while he thought he was serving him. That's because he had the scroll memorized, but he did not have the spirit of the living God flowing through him. And when we operate out of the flesh, we are at war with God. I, I, I don't think any hands would go up, but if I said by a show of hands, how many of you want to be at war with God? I don't, I don't think we'd raise our hands. But when we operate out of the flesh, when we are wise in our own eyes, when we do not fear the Lord, we are at war with God. So how do we fight this battle between the flesh and the spirit? Well, lucky for you, I got some things that could be helpful. And I got six of them. I got six areas of our life where we should be on constant battle with, am I giving this over to God and his spirit, or am I walking with the flesh? Uh, my dad uh, was a police officer for 15 years, and so my dad was an investigator, and so uh, I grew up getting interrogated by my dad, and uh, that was really uh, just great. It was really fun. Uh, and uh, I got six questions with these six areas that can help you Ask yourself some tough stuff. Am I operating by the spirit or am I operating by the flesh? Because I think if you ask God and if you take some time for self-assessment, you can maybe identify a few areas in your life where you're operating out of the flesh and not out of the spirit. And if you make it through all six and you got no areas where you're operating out of the flesh, I want to meet you, okay? Just want to meet you. Just want to meet you. All right, let's look at the first area. First one, framework. Framework. Here's a question for you. Who sets the scoreboard of your life? Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. What have you set in your mind as your basic operating system of what you're pursuing in life? How do you determine what is success for you? Is that only with your own fleshly desires or is there a spirit that is fueling it all? For my mentor, he, became, he came in a crossroads between what he thought success in life was and what God was leading him into. And guess what? Following the scoreboard of what God has called him to lead into actually made him more successful. But we all have to decipher 
where in my life am I setting a scoreboard on that scoreboard that maybe, maybe that's not the thing. What if the NBA, the new scoreboard of success was how many rebounds like you made in a game? Like all of a sudden Dennis Rodman is the goat. What, what if, what if golf, like how many strokes you could make in a game? Some of y'all will be on the tour, right? <laughs> like you change the scoreboard, all of a sudden success changes, right? What if it's not about the newest, greatest, best, but being content with what you have, thanking God for what's in your hands and remembering how far he brought you? I was sitting in my house whining about square footage the other day, and I remember that I'm living in a house that's double the square footage of what I grew up in. I remember sharing the bathroom with everyone who came in our house. And now I got my own with a door that locks. The door locks, y'all. And I'm whining about not having a loft. Lofts aren't bad. I'm not saying living in the spirit will make you complacent and remove your drive. But when you have a different motivation, when you're working for the next thing from a place of contentment, ooh, now you cooking. Now you cooking. I heard uh, the founder of Netflix uh, say uh, one of his metrics of success was every Tuesday at five o'clock, he was home, driving home for his date night with his wife. He said every Tuesday, every week, for his whole career, he never missed a date night on Tuesday night. He said employees knew if the company was falling down and it was 455, you better be talking to him on his walk to his car. Because his success was, I will not be another great startup that wins the world in my business but loses my marriage. And guess what? There should be a part of your scoreboard that looks weird to somebody else. Authority. Authority. Who do you submit to? Romans chapter 8, verse 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Governed, governed. Governed. Who are you governed by? Have you ever seen those videos where um, uh, people are yelling at the cops for cops doing cop stuff? You ever seen those videos? Have you ever seen the videos of the parents who are at the soccer game and they yelling at the ref who's a volunteer, 16 year old, and trying to punch him in the face? You, you, ever, <laughs> you, you ever see someone like just go off and yell at the teacher that they want to teach their kids, but surely their Tommy can't ever have a problem in class? And, Tommy's never the problem. Like, have you ever seen people who ruin their lives because they don't know how to submit to authority? I'm going to tell this story. Uh, uh, my my, my uh, cousin, she was in boot camp. She was in officer candidate school, and uh, her drill instructor was being rough on her, and my aunt found out, and my aunt found out the name of the drill instructor and called him and tried to tell him to not back off. Uh, you, <laughs> Hey, uh, uh, my, my cousin's not a lieutenant. Uh, uh, it's a scary place when you don't know how to submit to authority. And your life looks like that when God's trying to tell you to do something and you don't do it. Time. Where, where do you invest your attention? Where do you invest your attention? Here's something I've been trying to do lately. I've been trying to pursue a life of not just holiness, but wholeness. And one of the things I've been trying to do is in my schedule is set up my life in such a way that if I'm having a bad day, how many days does it take before I bump up into something on my schedule that gives me life? So reading God's word, uh, being in a small group, being accountable to other people. How many days does it take for you to get back on the path when you're off of it? And your time, you cannot control time, but you can put things in your schedule that help you stay connected to the Spirit of the living God. Hardship. Hardship. 
What do you lean on when hard times hit? I was talking to uh, this incredible leader, and I respect them. And they said, hey, uh, I've never been a full-blown alcoholic, but I've always had a struggle with alcohol. And my spouse is in and out of town uh, for work. And when they're out of town, I tend to drink more. So I have some friends who just check in with me and say, hey, how are you doing with that? Because they know that when hard times hit, that's a place they run to. What do you run to when hard times hit? That's a great way of knowing if you're operating in the flesh or the spirit. Empathy. Empathy. Are you growing in compassion for the unlovable? Are you growing in compassion for the unlovable? When Jesus went through the trauma of losing Lazarus, he was heartbroken and he tried to withdraw. But when he saw the hurt of those around him, he was filled with compassion and healed more, served more, because he wouldn't let his pain just cancel everything out. Are you growing in your compassion for the unlovable? When someone says something crazy on the Facebook, can you grow in your compassion for them? Hey, election season's coming. I'm watching you. Can you grow with compassion for the unlovable, for people who are on the other side of the aisle? Man, I'll see people. Hey, if you vote this way, there's no way you can be a Christian. So the litmus test of our faith for the finished work of Jesus Christ done on a cross is with a political affiliation that will be here today and gone tomorrow? Hey, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to vote your passion. It's okay to share what you believe, but do not replace your faith with the idol of politics. I'm going to say it just like that. Leave it there. We'll keep it going. Uh, relationship. 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 Are you wholeheartedly following him? Wholeheartedly isn't perfect. Wholeheartedly isn't without flaws. Wholeheartedly is just getting back up again after you made a mistake. That's my favorite thing as a pastor. I'll share with you one addiction I've got. I am addicted to watching what happens when people give their lives to Christ and just watching it move. Uh, 2011, I met this lady, came into the church uh, straight up. She was a crackhead, straight up crackhead. No ifs, ands, no buts about it. And I've seen God not just give her sobriety, but heal her spirit. And every time I see her on Facebook, it's 2024, she looks younger than when I met her in her 40s in 2011. And it's just so cool to see it. I'm seeing dads in this room show up and teach in our children's ministry when that wasn't the history of their past because they're just wholeheartedly following him. And as they seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, God adds everything else to them. And here's the amazing part of being led by the Spirit. You don't have to do anything other than make yourself available. You don't have to do anything other than make yourself available, allow yourself to be a student, and just take a step when God calls you. Right before Jesus went to the cross, he starts praying for all the believers. And he says, my prayer it's not just for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also believe so that the world may believe you. You have sent me. Mm. God just wants us to be one with our heavenly Father just like he was one with him. And so let's take a moment to review. F. Framework. A, authority. T, time. H, hardship. 
E, empathy. R, relationship. Spells father. And here's the thing. Being led by the Spirit is being led by your heavenly father. And when we're led by our heavenly father, he will lead us through troubled waters. He will lead us through hard times. He will lead us to a land flowing with milk and honey. He will give us life. He will give us peace. He will give us the desires of our heart. But it all just starts with an act of surrender because he is a good father and he can be trusted with every part of your life. <laughs> father, I thank you so much for the gift and the hope and the joy of your spirit. Father, I would pray for the skeptic in the room. Uh, lots of reasons why you came to church, but they're hurting and they just need you to show up. Show up in their lives today. Father, I pray for uh, the Pharisee that doesn't even know they are one. Um, Help them to see where being led by the Spirit, um, they've taken their hand out of yours and they've been starting to live out their faith on their own strength, on their own self-righteousness. Father, I pray for the person who feels like they're at a dead end in their life, where they can't see anything but walls closing in on them. Help them to look up and see you as a father that wants to fight with them through these battles. Bless us now. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen.